This is the nature of things. At the end of this picturesque pier in Whitewold, Manitoba, is one of the largest and most beautiful freshwater lakes on the planet, Lake Winnipeg. For over a century, tens of thousands of vacationers have come here each summer to enjoy its beaches. But the question for this young girl is one that wouldn't have been asked just a few decades ago. Will the walk down this pier end in an evening of blissful swimming, or is something ominous lurking in these waters? Canada has more than three million lakes, including some of the largest in the world. Lake Winnipeg is one of them, but it's in trouble. A perfect storm is brewing. The planet's 10th largest freshwater lake has been ignored for decades, but now that's beginning to change. It's another scorching hot August weekend in Gimli, Manitoba. The Icelandic festival is in full swing, with over 50,000 visitors expected to celebrate those who settled these scenic shores 120 years ago. Things are how they should be, fun, relaxing. But it's not so serene just across the lake at Victoria Beach. One of Canada's finest beaches should be packed with sun seekers, but there are only a few brave souls. The reason is inescapable. For four days, this usually pristine beach has been under attack, a green attack. A blanket of sludge lines the shore and the water is as thick as pea soup, the stench unbearable. It's a problem that has been escalating since the 1990s. Algal blooms are exploding, and warning signs are now a feature of beach life on Lake Winnipeg. These changes to Lake Winnipeg haunt scientist and Gimli resident, Al Christofferson. Lake Winnipeg is one of the great lakes of the world. In fact, it's the 10th largest lake by surface area, yet it's a very, very poorly studied lake. And we all assumed, somewhat naively, that nothing would happen to Lake Winnipeg. Well, it did. At nearly 25,000 square kilometers, Lake Winnipeg is the heart of one of the largest and most extraordinary freshwater drainage basins on Earth. Positioned almost exactly in the center of North America, Lake Winnipeg's waters eventually flow into the Arctic. The lake is also home to the third largest hydroelectric reservoir in the world. Beginning in 1974, Manitoba Hydro blocked the Nelson River, the northern outflow of the lake, with a series of enormous dams. Since then, Lake Winnipeg's water levels have been stabilized. But perhaps the lake's most unique feature is where its waters come from. Lake Winnipeg's watershed is massive. It's almost a million square kilometers, and it covers four Canadian provinces and four US states. From the Rocky Mountains, across all of Western Canada and including the Bow and the South Saskatchewan River watersheds, the Assiniboine River watershed, the Winnipeg River watershed, and the massive Red River watershed coming up from the United States. All that water eventually makes its way here to the huge but shallow Lake Winnipeg.
Mice connection to Lake Winnipeg goes way back to my grandfather and my great-grandfather. They both were immigrants from Iceland and they came here in the late 19th century and they kept their family alive by fishing in Lake Winnipeg. The water quality in the lake was fine, and fish were plentiful, nothing to worry about. People started coming down to the beaches in the early 20th century. Nice clean water washing up on the beach. For decades, no one thought about Lake Winnipeg's health. Only two major studies of the lake have ever been done. One in 1929, the other in 1969. Both showed a normal, healthy lake. But that changed in the 1990s. First, the algal blooms became more frequent. And then, there was the horrendous Red River flood in 1997. Suddenly, water quality became an issue. In 1998, Al Christofferson and others in the lake community raised the funds needed to launch this retooled Coast Guard vessel, the Nemeo. With it, they founded the Lake Winnipeg Research Consortium. This floating laboratory is Lake Winnipeg's first and only research ship. So we established what we call 65 stations or locations covering the entire lake. And those stations are sampled spring, summer, and fall each year to see what's happening in the lake. For two weeks at a time, the Nemeo's scientific crews traverse the lake. Their goal is to map the lake's ecology, and most importantly, to understand why an explosion of algae is taking place. Algae are an absolutely important part of the lake ecosystem. They form the base of the food chain. And blooms form naturally, usually in late summer when the water warms up. But going back about 20 or so years ago, the blooms began to become more frequent and more extensive. Fishers reported algae clogging their fishing nets. So clearly, this was becoming a problem. Algae are tiny aquatic life forms filled with green chlorophyll. They multiply and float in most parts of the lake, and healthy lakes all have some algae. Lake Winnipeg's problem is that not only are algal blooms becoming more frequent, but they are exploding. Their full extent is only visible from outer space. Satellite imagery reveals the scale of the blooms. Lake scientist Greg McCullough was the first to analyze the photos. What really struck me, and what was amazing to me at, at the very beginning, was just how big it was. Producing what you see there in that image, you see a brilliant green bloom that covers 10 or 12,000 square kilometers of lake. What satellite images do for us is they make a broader public much more aware of how massive the problem is in Lake Winnipeg. The largest algal bloom ever recorded on Lake Winnipeg was 25,000 square kilometers. It covered the entire surface of the lake. It is something that suddenly became a serious problem within a few short years in the mid-1990s there was a sort of a switch that had turned on and changed the lake fairly dramatically in a very short period of time. That sudden shift in lake ecology was also caught by one of Nemeo's research teams. University of Manitoba biologist Brenda Han monitors microorganisms in the water column and on the lake bottom. She has discovered some striking changes in the populations of organisms that are living in the lake. The big change that we have seen is that uh, from 69 to 
the first decade of this century, we are really, really looking at at least a doubling and in some organisms a tripling of the density of the organisms that are present in and on those sediments. These changes are being driven by algal blooms, and the blooms are showing their presence in both these warm summer waters and in the frigid waters beneath this thick winter ice. University of Manitoba biologist Gordon Goldsboro and his team are also looking at lake bottom sediment for clues as to what is happening. Four, Four. meters, boy, you picked a good spot. <laughs> Each year, dead algae add another layer to the sediment. For those who can read it, the lake's history is revealed in those layers. The length of time that a particular sediment core represents is dependent a lot on the nature of the lake. A 20 centimeter core could represent a couple of centuries. I've pushed up our core. Now I noticed that the surface of the sediment here is very green, uh, which is an indication we've got a lot of algae. Don't normally see this kind of green surface of sediments. Goldsboro's findings show that something is altering the food supply so that it unnaturally favors algae. Well, what we found out so far, things are pretty constant for the first 100 years or so in the past. It's only about the last 40 or so years that things really start to change. And as you get right near the surface, things really start to change. For lake expert Alex Selke, algal levels in Lake Winnipeg are in a league of their own. If you look at the 10 largest lakes in the world and you look at their mean summer chlorophyll concentrations, it has the highest chlorophyll concentration of any of those large lakes in the world. The key to solving the problem is understanding the true nature of the problem. The problem is eutrophication. Eutrophication is the fancy word for nutrient enrichment. In a sense, it's a good thing. More algae means more fish, and that's what we've been seeing the last little while. And that is the paradox of the lake. While the algal blooms have exploded, fishermen up and down the lake are reporting unheard of fish catches. Now we, uh, it's all big fish for some reason. I don't know. I don't know the reason of it. They got too much seed or eating too much or whatever it is. But it's changing. We don't pretend to be scientists, but we do know our business, and you know, the fish is plentiful in the last few years. Veteran fishermen like Jason Donald, who fishes off Victoria Beach, have had to increase the size of their fishing nets. Five, seven years ago, we were fishing uh, three and three quarter inch nets, getting fairly good catches, but we never ever got into the four and five inch nets. But then now, in the last couple of years, it seems that that size has really come around. Six, seven pounds, roughly. Jason Donald can earn as much as $6,000 for a morning's work. For him, the algae aren't a problem. If that's the case, let the algae come, because it's improving our fishing. But hopefully it doesn't crash, you know. Lake Winnipeg is naturally productive. But there is nothing natural about the increase in fish populations. The commercial fishery is producing more fish now than it ever has in recorded history. Some people think that that's a puzzle. Well, it's not a puzzle at all. Uh, it's a predictable consequence of eutrophication in the early stages. Studies of uh, the effect of eutrophication on fish populations in other parts of the world have been very revealing. We know if we don't do anything about it, they will all ultimately reach a tipping point and collapse. If fish populations suddenly collapse, the culprit would be a dead zone. Dead zones occur when a lake's oxygen levels drop to dangerously low levels. When the algae die, they sink to the bottom and are consumed by bacteria in a process that uses up all of the oxygen in the water, essentially choking the lake from the bottom up. The deoxygenated water spreads through the lake, killing species that can't move away. Not only are the fish populations at risk 
due to changes in algae populations. Another worrisome change is an increase in the number of species of algae that can be lethal to humans. The fear now is that blue-green algae, called cyanobacteria, could take over the lake. With warm water, sunlight, and abundant nutrients, blue-green algae can multiply rapidly in the upper layer of water. Eventually, they crowd out other harmless algae living below. In the 1960s, only 30% of the algae in the lake were blue-green algae. Now, they are sometimes 90%. This is terrible. This is a, a very thick bloom. In fact, I actually have to wash the algae off the outside of the bottle because I can't even see the algae on the inside of the bottle. Brian Kotek is an expert on toxic algae. He knows that lots of people still use the lake, especially when the algae aren't that obvious. But the risk to humans escalates when there's a bloom near a beach. Our concern is with the blue-green algae, which are very prolific in, in Lake Winnipeg. They're the ones that produce uh, a number of different types of toxins, both liver toxins and potentially also produce neurotoxins as well. A dog in July of, of 2009 died within an hour of actually drinking green lake water, so the effects on an animal can be very immediate and very dramatic. The concentration of the toxin in this sample uh, I would suspect will be very high and um, probably much higher than what the World Health Organization would classify as being safe water for recreational contact. So if a, a small child went into the lake water such as it is today and if the bloom was actually producing uh, the microcystins or these liver toxins, there's a high probability that that child could experience at the very least things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Certainly we've seen evidence elsewhere in, in the world where, where people have uh, accidentally ingested these toxins and have died. We are just beginning to realize that Lake Winnipeg is caught in a complex web of ecological and human circumstances, a perfect storm of factors that are putting the lake and its inhabitants at risk. This is Lake 227, a test tube lake. It's part of one of the largest laboratories in the world. The research being done here in Northern Ontario holds the key to just one of the many complex clues as to why a perfect storm is brewing in Lake Winnipeg's waters. For 40 years, scientists have added phosphorus to 227, and that has kept this once pristine lake eutrophied or nutrient rich. We had phosphorus in the shoreline over there, and it slowly dribbles into the lake over the course of the week. It tries to simulate the kind of process that would happen if stuff is washing off the watershed. Phosphorus is a generally harmless chemical, but it can have a deadly impact on lakes and rivers because it's also a fertilizer. In the 1970s, scientists like Mike Stainton wanted to test their theory that it was phosphorus that was responsible for the massive blue-green algal blooms that were choking Lake Erie. We've used this lake to simulate the kinds of uh, impacts that initially were happening to Lake Erie. What was learned fairly quickly is how different the observations were when you do the experiment on a lake scale versus bottles. In bottles, you got completely different uh, understanding of what was controlling algal growth. Since then, we've 
adjusted the ratios of nitrogen and phosphorus to see how that changes the dominance of different algal groups. And what 40 years of experiments on this lake have proven is that if you want to reduce algal growth on a lake, you have to reduce the amount of phosphorus going into it. There are many sources of phosphorus that end up in Lake Winnipeg. Phosphorus-rich detergents, sewage, intensive pig farming, and fertilizers from agriculture. Don Flayton and his team of University of Manitoba soil scientists are conducting a unique set of experiments. How are we for level? Their goal is to determine how rainstorms affect phosphorus runoff from farmers' fields. What we've got is a nozzle at the top of the rainfall simulator, and uh, it delivers a pattern that's very similar to natural rainfall. The runoff from the soil and the residue, and then it's collected by vacuum down this tube here. And so far, the results are clear. The more fertilizer on the land, the more phosphorus flows off it. It does show that consistently, if we add more and more and more phosphorus to the soil, there isn't a single soil that we've worked with that we don't get more and more phosphorus in the runoff. In a race to become more cost-efficient and mechanized, farmers spread massive quantities of phosphorus-based fertilizer over their land. But what happens to that fertilizer when it's washed off the land? Pascal Badieu and Shane Gabor have discovered that phosphates from these fields north of Brandon can travel 300 kilometers, eventually ending up in Lake Winnipeg. What we're doing here is collecting flow measurements every 15 minutes using a set of area flow velocity devices to determine the mass of nutrients flowing past this point and downstream into the receiving watershed. Phosphorus levels in this stream are typically quite high. In the spring, they can be as high as between one to two milligrams per liter, which is as high as you find in some sewage effluent. What we found was that there's 114 tons of phosphorus that can come off the area of southwestern Manitoba, and that number probably doesn't mean a whole lot to, to most people, but it's the equivalent to 544,000 bags of lawn fertilizer being dumped into Lake Winnipeg every year. Farmers have always fertilized their fields, but the changes wrought on the prairies by modern farming techniques have destroyed the land's ability to absorb excess nutrients. To create more farmland, small marshes called prairie potholes, the prairie's natural cleansers, were drained. This part of the, the country is called the prairie pothole region, and those wetlands are really isolated from stream systems unless you connect them with a, an actual ditch, and that's occurred on about 70% of the wetlands here. And that's what's causing uh, water quality issues in other parts of the province. It can be several hundred miles away. So it's, it's not just local effects. These effects can be um, a great distance downstream. Over the past 40 years, 6,000 of the 8,000 potholes have been drained in this area alone. Across the entire prairie region, it's estimated that millions of these ecologically valuable micro marshes have been lost. In its native state, this wetland would have held quite a significant amount of water, would have had emergent vegetation, waterfowl would have lived here, it would have been home to invertebrate and other wildlife. What's happening in this condition is we've, we put a drain on it, it's draining downstream, and all the nutrients that would have been sequestered here for hundreds, if not thousands of years, are now flowing downstream into receiving water, such as Lake Winnipeg. 
The downstream effect of all these drain marshes is astonishing, particularly after a summer thunderstorm. While this may look like a pristine sunrise over Lake Winnipeg, it is not. This is a farmer's field. Only a few decades ago, most of the phosphorus in this water would have been removed by its slow journey through the micro marshes. But that is no longer the case. Worse, most of the phosphorus is now coming off the fields at one time of the year, the spring melt. 90% of the phosphorus is going into the lake at this time of the year, during the two or three weeks of the flooding in the spring. That's when the phosphorus is running in from the landscape into the river and then eventually into Lake Winnipeg. Were it not for these drains, this land would be wet. In fact, if you look at the farmland behind me, it's all bone dry. And why? It's because small little channels have been excavated in it with literally laser precision to drain every last bit of water into these drains and then on its way to the Red River. Over the past hundred years, and often supported by huge government subsidies and infrastructure dollars, over 27,000 kilometers of storm drains have been dug across southern Manitoba alone. This mesh of culverts and gutters now crisscrosses the entire province, flushing phosphorus, quite literally, down the drain. One of the most extreme examples of artificial drainage in all of Western Canada is here at Tobacco Creek. Here, a series of 30 kilometer long drains funnel water and its payload of suspended phosphorus towards the Red River and up to the lake. You can see the very distinct brown color to the water, the, uh, the colloidal material from the soil that's been picked up and it's making all this foam that we see behind us. Undoubtedly, there's a lot of phosphorus there that's been transported off of the farmland and it's heading on its way straight towards the Red River, dumping it into the river and then heading it off north into Lake Winnipeg. Watershed problems aren't the only issues affecting the health of Lake Winnipeg. The perfect ecological storm is also being driven by changes to the lake's southern entrance. At the southern end of Lake Winnipeg is a giant, little understood phosphorus filter, the Netley Lebo Marsh. At 260 square kilometers, it's more than twice the size of Vancouver. And it is key to reducing the flow of phosphorus from the Red River into the lake. This marsh is easily one of the largest on the continent. So what is a marsh? As you can see around me, there's all kinds of plants. Uh, here, for example, we have some giant reed grass. We have some uh, common cattail. But a really important part of a marsh is the stuff on the ground. We bring it up here, and we get this all of this litter, this uh, remains of plants and animals that have lived and died over decades. You know, this is where all the action is. And this is where there's probably millions, billions of bacteria and fungi busy breaking down chemicals so that when things end up running into the marsh, they encounter this and they're either broken down or they're stored away. And that's why we say that marshes are nature's kidneys. But like the prairie potholes, the marsh has undergone some massive changes. Behind me is the limitless expanse of the Netley Lebo Marsh. And you look around and it looks really productive. There's lots of plants. But do you hear anything? That's my point. No ducks, no geese. It's a dead marsh. <laughs> in days gone by, you would have looked out over this marsh and seen vast numbers of ducks and geese. The sky would have been black. The sound would have just deafened you.
Today, nothing. Having spent over 35 years on Netli Lebo Marsh as a fishing and hunting guide, Stu McKay has witnessed a dramatic decline in the diverse mix of marshland plants necessary for duck nesting and staging sites. We don't have the breeding sites anymore, and the, the duck population, uh, well, it's suffered dramatically because of it, obviously. You take away habitat, you're gonna, you're gonna lose your population of birds. We're talking a wetland on the south end of Lake Winnipeg that makes up over 100 square miles. So when you start playing with that type of ecology, you're gonna do some serious damage, unfortunately. To understand the extent of the loss of marshland, Goldsboro needs to see the bigger picture. Check Winnipeg Tower now, 118. Goldsboro's plan is to take a series of aerial photos that he hopes will reveal what has happened to the marsh. There's a lot less vegetation now than there used to be. So I'd like to pass right over so we can see that netly cut. Armed with the photos, Goldsboro searches the Manitoba archives for old pictures of the marsh. He discovers a treasure trove of aerial photos taken in 1923. The massive transformation that the marsh has undergone is all too clear. In the modern photograph, you see that fairly dramatic cut over on the right. In 1923, that channel was very narrow. In fact, probably very little water flowed through that channel. And then if you look at the marsh itself, man, there's a big change. In the present marsh, you see one big open body of water. In 1923, there was a lot of vegetation in that marsh. It was what we call a hemi marsh, meaning uh, sort of half marsh. We, we've changed, among other things, the direction that the river takes when it finds its way out into Lake Winnipeg. And the stuff that's in the river doesn't get held up by the marsh, so there's really nothing stopping it anymore. You know, we've lost, I suppose, the last line of defense between the land and the water. You know, this was nature's way of protecting the lake. And unfortunately, nature's defenses are gone. Several theories have been proposed to explain what has caused the loss of more than 50% of the marsh since the 1920s. Some argue that increased precipitation has raised water levels, drowning the marsh. While others attribute the loss to something artificial, something that happened just prior to the explosion of algal blooms on Lake Winnipeg. In 1975, when the dam on the northern outflow of the lake was completed, water levels were stabilized for electric power generation. If they keep Lake Winnipeg artificially high, in the not too distant future, or at least down the road, the, the, this marsh is gonna be completely gone. Surprisingly, marshes do not do well if their water levels remain stable. To flourish, they need temporary droughts to allow their seeds to germinate. But since 1975, that rarely happens here. But for the hydro dam to work, the lake level needs to remain stable and high. There is little doubt that Manitoba has benefited from the billions of dollars of energy that has traveled down these wires to its citizens and is exported to the United States. There is growing evidence that since the 1970s, when the dam was built at the top end of the lake, nutrients are no longer flushed out. Now, the phosphorus is trapped. We have some evidence from the original study on this lake in 1969. At that time, the lake was retaining about 25% of the phosphorus that was going into the lake. Uh, then in 1994 to 201, the lake was retaining about 75% of the phosphorus going into the lake. So there had been this change, this apparent change of 50% between 69 and 2000. The increased retention of lake phosphorus can also be seen in the data 
that are coming from labs like this one at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Winnipeg. World-renowned algae specialist Hetty Kling has seen the concentration of blue-green algae explode since hydro bottled up the lake. The biomass of algae in Lake Winnipeg is higher than I've seen in any of the other lakes that I've been looking at. Since they put the dam on the outflow of the lake, they've slowed the flow of water so that the algae are growing and the nutrients and the, the biomass of algae are being kept in the lake rather than flowing freely downstream. Manitoba Hydro was asked to comment on the research results but they refused to be interviewed. They've only said, quote, our actions, to our knowledge, have never affected the water quality of Lake Winnipeg. Many scientists think that research on the impact of turning Lake Winnipeg into a giant hydro reservoir is critical in order to ensure a healthy future for the lake. The lake is now the third largest reservoir in the world. And I think that if there's anything inside the lake itself that we have to look at, that's an issue that we have to resolve. The restoration of natural water cycles will be key to saving the Netli Lebo Marsh. Gordon Goldsboro wants Hydro to institute drawdowns of the lake every five to seven years so that its natural diversity is restored. If the marsh was restored, it would also have a major impact on the lake's algal problem. So anything we could do that could prevent some of that phosphorus from going into the lake would be a good thing. If we could somehow increase the amount of plant growth back to what it was in the old days, we'd get back some of that capacity by simply having a healthy, functional marsh at the mouth of the river. For all its size, Lake Winnipeg is vulnerable to the huge watershed it drains. Its watershed is one million square kilometers, so there won't be a single solution. But good news is coming from surprising places. While no one solution will fix Lake Winnipeg's perfect storm of ecological problems, a series of small solutions implemented across its massive watershed just might. This looks like any other wheat field, but a closer inspection tells another story. Pig manure used as fertilizer was a problem, but the process that farmer Rolf Penner uses to apply it changes all that. He sees himself and his livelihood as part of the solution to Lake Winnipeg's woes. Looking back at my grandfather's day, the stuff would wash into the ditches and work its way into the waterways. Today, we've gone to a very different system we inject the manure directly into the soil. It goes in up to four inches deep. You need a very substantial amount of water to move that phosphorus and those nutrients from that depth. Rolf Penner's new farming methods help Lake Winnipeg, and these practices could be implemented in tens of thousands of farms across Western Canada and the United States. Then, there would be a measurable improvement to the lake's water quality. But no matter how careful farmers are, there will always be nutrient runoff. Slowing down its journey off the land is key to reducing the amount of phosphorus that ends up in the lake. So at South Tobacco Creek, Manitoba, 52 micro dams have been created to catch farm runoff. They slow it down by creating small marshes that capture phosphorus in their plants. Essentially, the small dam system here is mimicking what beaver dams would have done in a natural environment. 
We're retaining water into these ponds, absorbing nutrients, the same as what beaver dams would have done in a natural situation. The results from these continually monitored micro marshes have shown up to a 90% decline in the flow rate off farmers' fields. And the uptake of phosphorus by the marsh vegetation in these small holding ponds is significant. It's essential for photosynthesis, blooming, and root growth. The trick now is to recycle the phosphorus trapped in these plants. Since uh, about 2006, we've been conducting research on harvesting of cattails to see if we could actually um, remove phosphorus or what we like to call it recover phosphorus from the aquatic systems. And it's amazing the amount of phosphorus that these cattails can absorb. You could actually harvest cattails. And so by removing the cattail growth, you remove the phosphorus from the system. And that is the plan for the future, a closed system. The harvesting, composting, and mulching of these phosphorus-rich marsh plants could be reapplied onto farms as fertilizer. But farmers are not the only ones who have a role to play in reducing the flow of phosphorus from the watershed. This inexpensive and eco-friendly sewage lagoon is pioneering another nutrient reduction experiment. Sewage once flowed untreated into Lake Winnipeg, but now these storage cells are changing that. This is a type of treatment facility that's used in hundreds of municipal uh, wastewater treatment facilities across the, uh, the lake basin. We've developed a design that we can control the flow rate of the sewage uh, coming from the lagoon through the filter basin. Now, these filter basins are basically uh, a combination of sands, gravels, mineral soils that we've put together. And on top of that, we've planted a series of native grasses, and um, we're achieving uh, removal rates uh, on the order of 70% for nitrogen and phosphorus. Wastewater upgrades keeping phosphorus-rich water on farms instead of allowing it to flow unimpeded into the lake. The restoration of marshes, both massive and tiny, all are part of the solution to keeping Lake Winnipeg's waters healthy. The result could see these children not having to swim near sewage outflows. It could see algal blooms like this become a thing of the past. It could also ensure that this young girl will always be able to swim off this historic pier. Essentially, it's a simple problem in a way. If you throw fertilizer on your lawn in your backyard, the grass will grow until that excess fertilizer is used up. If you throw fertilizer, nutrients into Lake Winnipeg, the algae will grow, and that's what's been happening. It took place on Lake Erie 40 years ago, and back then, we weren't really sure that this whole process was reversible. We found out that in fact it was. So we know we can recover Lake Winnipeg, we just have to do the right things. I think it's a good future because one of the things that we have going for us is it responds very quickly to what's going on in the watershed. If we improve the watershed, improve the water quality of the waters coming into the lake, we can improve the lake. Lake Winnipeg is sending out a distress call. There is still time to save this great lake. Next time on The Nature of Things, a most adaptable creature. There's many things about raccoon behavior that we just don't understand. What we know is just the tip of the iceberg. The big city raccoon. The urban lifestyle changes how they live and maybe even how they think.